I want to thank Tony and the organizers of this conference and why it's my pleasure and privilege to be here in a particular way is we simply have to get the Marian movements together. We have to have these different strands of the Holy Spirit through the Immaculate Heart of Mary working together because what did we see yesterday? We saw that the adversary is concerted. The adversary is organizing different movements of a culture of death, of cultures against faith and marriage. Uh, he's being very effective because, sadly, there's a unity in movements against our holy Catholic faith, the truths of our faith, the morals of our faith. And so the Marian movements must respond together. While we can be dedicated to a particular movement with, with a particular charism, we have to be working together to bring forth the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And so it's a, it's a grace and a privilege to be here. You know, yesterday we'll go down in history as the Roe v. Wade of marriage. And we will have to do reparation. I believe that if you accurately look at authentic Marian prophecy in the last two centuries, the two sins that called down God's justice more than any other two sins is abortion and homosexuality. And now, when we're saying that, we're not judging the person who has a same-sex tendency. We're talking about the removal and rejection of marriage as instituted by God. This cannot be done without serious ramification. So we don't get depressed or we don't despair, but we do up our prayer. We do up our reparation and we do work together to bring forth the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary because Our Lady has brought forward several different movements that are one in heart, united in the spirit. I wanna talk about one of those today, but first I wanna give a little background because as you know, authentic Marian love has to be based on authentic Marian truth. So we always start with what does the church teach about our Blessed Mother? And from there, we will have a proper disposition of our hearts. Now, as many of you know, there are presently four dogmas, four divine teachings about Our Lady. In 431, she was defined as the Mother of God. In 649, she was defined as virginal before, during, and after the birth of Jesus Christ. In 1854, her Immaculate Conception. And in 1950, her Assumption, Body and Soul into Heaven. I want you to note one thing about those four dogmas. And again, what's a dogma? A dogma is where a pope takes his papal highlighter and says, focus on this. This is central. It doesn't create a truth. He calls us to accentuate a truth. For example, 1949, one year before the dogma of the Assumption, was the dogma, well, excuse me, was the Assumption a doctrine of the church? Absolutely, it was. So what changed in 1950? The focus, the appreciation, the grace that comes from acknowledging it. Now, those four dogmas all focus on Mary's relationship to Jesus or her, her individual prerogatives. What do they not include? None of them include her relationship to you or to me. And that's why the truth about Mary will always be incomplete until her relationship with us is solemnly defined. Now, in 1915, a renowned Belgian cardinal, Cardinal Desiree Mercier, said, it's time to define that. It's time to define that she is co-redemptrix and mediatrix of all graces. And don't get um, knee-jerky about co-redemptrix. Uh, Our Lady's been called co-redemptrix since the 14th century. It just means Mary helped Jesus save souls more than anybody else. That's an easy one. Mary suffers with Jesus as the new Eve along with the new Adam to obtain grace and to redeem humanity. That's, these are all easy. John Paul II, St. John Paul II said, you are called to be a co-redeemer. When Pope Benedict went to Fatima, he said, you're all called to be redeemers in the redeemer. This is easy. That means this is a typical Jesus thing to do. He saves the world, but he wants us to participate in it. And we do. 
with our prayers, with our sacrifices, with our suffering. It's called co-redemption. So Cardinal Mercy had a very simple idea back in 1950, a hundred years ago this year. He said, if, if this is defined, we will get a historic release of grace. Why? Because in our free will, we'll be saying, yes, we give fiat to your fiat. We give our yes to the fact that you are the mediatrix of all graces. And the more you do that, the more she can do her part as our spiritual mother. So it's a very simple concept. With every single dogma in the history of the church, there's been historic grace. And again, if, if you're still stirred by what happened yesterday, that's probably a good sign because when you have dynamic evil, you have to have a dynamic response in grace, in encouragement, and prayer. We need a historic influx of grace now. Anybody who thinks we're going to do this on a human level, on a diplomatic level, uh, is naive. Maybe well-intended, but naive. We need a supernatural influx of grace. And let's, let's keep our hope because uh, Sheen says it's right. God always works in the minority. He works in the minority so it doesn't go to our head like the victory is ours. But we're becoming more and more and more a minority. And that means we've got to get more of a remnant spirit about us. That means we don't wait till someone else does the right thing. We don't wait until uh, our, the majority of our parish are doing adoration and the whole rosary and other elements of prayer that Our Lady has calling us to. We take the lead. We become the remnant person. And that is the, boundi, the, the foundation by which historic graces happen. So I want, to, I want to bring us up to 1950 for a second. In 1950, the world's greatest Mariologist went to Rome. And it was one month after Pius XII declared the Assumption. And I know there's a danger of saying, well, these dogmas, that's, it's kind of nice ivory tower theologians, that's, that's good, but what does it do for me? Well, the world's Mariologist came together in Rome and they asked Pius XII, now that you defined the Assumption, will you do this for us? Will you define Mary as the mediatrix of all graces? Now, one might say, well, that's a little unrealistic. One month later, another definition. Why did they say it? Because, again, the truth about lady, our, our Lady is incomplete until her relationship with us is defined. Can you imagine a mother who's poured into her children, who's suffered for her children, who's nourished her children, who's pleaded for her children, but she's never called mother? She's never acknowledged for her motherhood. She's only acknowledged, for example, for being a wonderful woman and a good wife. But she's also been a sublime mother. That's also true about Our Lady. And so the Mariologist called the Pope to do that. The Second Vatican Council, when all the bishops were coming to Rome, they asked, what do you guys want to talk about? The two greatest items that they wanted to talk about before they came to Vatican II, number one, was a condemnation of communism. Number two was to define Mary as the mediatrix of all graces. So this is in the heart of the church. Now, while this is happening in the heart of the church, Our Lady, through private revelation, confirms us. This is something we simply have to understand. Private revelation, authentic private revelation, is such a gift to the church. It does not compete with scripture and tradition as interpreted by the magisterium. But it accentuates, it highlights what the church needs to focus on at a given moment of human history. Take, for example, divine mercy. Is mercy in scripture? Of course mercy is in scripture. Is mercy in the magisterium? Of course it's in the magisterium. Well, then why did Jesus appear to Faustina? Because Jesus knew the 20th century, apart from what we think of it as Production, cars, planes, technology. The 20th century would go down in history as the century of the greatest number of terrorists and state executions and homicides in all history. 120 million people died in the 20th century. Some say more than the other uh, previous 15 centuries before. It was a century of death. And so... Jesus knew we need more emphasis on mercy. 
So what happens? Jesus comes to Faustina. Faustina receives the message. It spreads throughout the church. A guy named Wojtyla becomes the Pope, and we get Divine Mercy Sunday and the Novena. That's what private revelation does, my friends. It accentuates, it calls us to focus on an aspect of what's already in Scripture and tradition for this age. And while I would say as a theologian, as the church says, technically we don't need private revelation, practically, thank God. Thank God for private revelation. If you were God right now, don't get ideas of grandeur, but, but if you were God right now and you saw the human family, would you not send the mother of Jesus with special graces? It, to me, it would, be, it would be almost a violation of fatherhood not to give special graces for the challenges of today. So let's thank God. Let's avoid the presumption of saying, I don't need private revelation. Look at the church. What would the 20th century be without Fatima and other authentic messages like the flame of love? So we thank God for private revelation. Well, in 1945, at a time almost contemporaneous with the flame of love, Our Lady begins to appear to a Dutch woman, a middle-aged Dutch woman, Ida Perdeman. We'd say Ida over here. And always we go to the position of the church. On May 31st of 2002, the Bishop of Amsterdam declared these apparitions to be of a supernatural origin. Constat de supernaturalitate, meaning this is supernatural, and that's always the first call of the local bishop to make that discernment. So we're talking about a church-approved apparition. So what happens on, in March of 1945? Our Lady appears to this Dutch woman, predicts the end of World War II, focuses on the rosary, and then for the next seven years starts making global prophecies. I don't mean prophecies about in the church, I mean prophecies in the world, geopolitical prophecies, social prophecies, political prophecies. For example, what? For example, in 1945, Our Lady tells Ida that Israel would be reunited. In 1948, it happens. In 1945, she predicts that there would be a red flag flying over China. And in 1949, uh, 49, uh, Mao Zedong has the communist revolution. In 1949, she sees the map of Korea with a big split through Korea and the prophecy that this division will cause future generations challenge. The next year, the Korean War happens and we're still having the threat of North Korea. Other prophecies, warring in the Balkans, warring around the city of Jerusalem, Prophecy after prophecy. Now, why would the mother of God give prophecies, not about the church, but about the world? Precisely to gain global credibility. I mean, not just Catholics, but people of the world who read the news say, how is this possible? How could this lady get this? In fact, uh, Dr. Richard Russell, who for 17 years worked with the CIA and is still a professor for them, said, what this little Dutch woman knew in the early 50s was more the, than the combined knowledge of both the CIA and the KGB. <laughs> Where is she going to get that? So it's credibility. And these prophecies have happened. Uh, one other prophecy, which is fascinating, in 1947, Ida saw Cairo. And in Cairo, she saw flags ramming into each other to indicate international conflict. And what have we just experienced? Well, what was called the Arab Spring. Now it's a bit more winter-like in light of its fruits. So prophecies to get the attention of the world. Our Lady also said there would be economic strife. There would be boycotts between the United States and Europe, never heard before. There would be currency wars, a word that wasn't even used in economics. And now China is purposely devaluating its money. In fact, it's a bit sad that European economic journals are quoting the Lady of All Nations and most Catholics have never heard of it. And they're quoting it because these are things no one knew. Why? To get credibility. Credibility for what? Credibility for what would start to be revealed three months after the Assumption in 1951. 
And in 1951, Our Lady begins speaking about the last Marian dogma. Now keep this in mind, please. In 1915, in the church, this movement had already begun. So it's not like the private revelation started the movement. It's, it's, it's heaven's confirmation. This is something heaven wants. And in fact, as we'll see, the, the condition, the price, the prerequisite for world peace hinges on this proclamation. Those are Our Lady's words. That is, simply put, no dogma, no triumph of the Immaculate Heart. No dogma, no era of peace for the world. Why? Because heaven has its criteria for peace. It's not so interested all the time in what the UN has to do or what political uh, elements have to do. It's got its own heavenly peace plan. It's not going to change its mind just because we're not cooperating. It'll wait. And when it waits, we suffer. So let's go to February 11th. And I want to go to uh, a message on the anniversary of Lourdes. When Our Lady reveals a prayer. Okay, so February 11th, 1951. Our Lady says, reveals this prayer, and I want to read it to you, and she wants everyone in the world to pray it daily. Let me just read the excerpt. And again, this is to Ida the Visionary. Quote, Then the Lady says to me, Let all men return to the cross. Only this can bring peace and tranquility. I am still standing in front of the cross with the Lady. She says to me, quote, Repeat this after me. Do say this prayer in front of the cross. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the Father, send now your Spirit over the earth. Let the Holy Spirit live in the hearts of all nations, that they may be preserved from degeneration, disasters, and war. May the Lady of all nations, who once was Mary, be our advocate. Amen. I am still standing in front of the cross and have said the prayer, and repeated the lady's words phrase by phrase. Now I see them written in large characters. The lady continues, my child, this prayer is so short and simple that each one can say it in his own tongue before his own crucifix. And those who have no crucifix repeat it to themselves. This is the message which I have come to give you today. For I have now come to tell you I want to save souls. Let all men cooperate in this great work for the world, if only everyone tried to follow this for himself. Now let's go back to that prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the Father, send now your Spirit over the earth. Let the Holy Spirit live in the hearts of all nations, that they may be preserved from degeneration, disasters, and war. May the Lady of all nations who once was Mary be our advocate. Amen. You know, I can't uh, say the prayer without thinking. The president of, of the Philippines, uh, four years ago, through her Vatican ambassador, gave a letter to Pope Benedict at that time, Pope Benedict now emeritus, asking him to proclaim this dogma. And the president of the Philippines said, I ask for this definition for the sake of the safety of my Filipino people, that they be saved from disaster. Now, I say, uh, first of all, one might think, uh, would our president do that? I'm not thinking so. Okay. Uh, we, we, we won't launder on that thought. But uh, secondly, since that time, and this is no judgment of all, since that time, the Philippines has experienced one of the greatest tsunamis recorded. Okay. How does that work? We see degeneration, moral breakdown rejection of the commandments, rejection of the priests of the church. That's what leads to the other two. Degeneration leads to A, disaster, B, war. And how does that work? That works because God the Father is more concerned about getting our souls to heaven for all eternity than that things are comfortable down here. He prefers to do it through mercy. If not, he withholds his protection and elements of justice take place. Those manifest themselves in natural disasters. You know, people get a little irritable whenever you talk about God using the weather uh, for the purpose of salvation. Where's the Old Testament? It's all over through the Old Testament. The plagues are used to get people to heaven, 
to get people to reconsider. Presently, disasters can be used to get people not from looking to Dow Jones for their security, but to the Father. You know, after 9-11, the prayer ratio, people going to Mass, went up 40% throughout the country. Six months later, it was down to 20%. A year later, it was just as it was before 9-11. So you see, the Father says, I'd rather things be shaken up so you look to me than that you're comfortable and lose your mortal souls. It's really tough love. Think of chastisements as a type of spank from the divine Abba. It's intended to bring us home. So the more degeneration there is, the more disaster and the more war, because God takes away his protection and he leaves us to himself. That's the thing we ought to fear, leaving the world to itself without the providence of, of God. So that's this prayer. Note, my friends, this prayer is asking Jesus to send the Holy Spirit a new, a new Pentecost, again, again, again. A new uh, descent of the Spirit in the hearts of all nations. Because it's not going to be through a type of political bribery that we give this country this much money so they don't fight with that country. It doesn't work. We've been doing it for 50 years in the Middle East. It doesn't work. You can't pay countries to be peaceful to each other. You need a new influx of the Spirit. And that only comes from Jesus. So the prayer is asking the Holy Spirit to enter the hearts of all nations in order to prevent degeneration, disaster, war. Then comes Our Lady. May the Lady of all nations who once was Mary be our advocate. Now let me give a, just a very brief comment on that phrase, who once was Mary. When Our Lady gave that to Ida, she gave it over to the bishop. Someone in the chancery office in, in, in Amsterdam said, I don't like that who once was Mary. Take it out. Who is she now? It's, it's kind of misleading. Uh, about three weeks later, Our Lady came back and said, put it back in. Because it's expressing that Mary of Nazareth had to say yes. She had to give fiat to become the mother of all peoples, which Jesus makes her at Calvary. Remember, when Jesus says, woman, behold your son, behold your mother, that's not an invitation. It's a statement of a theological fact. She's your mother now. Behold her. Behold her like John did. Take her into your home. Take her into your heart. I'm not offering my mother as your mother. I'm telling you, my mother is now your mother. And the Christian has to respond accordingly. And, and so this is the dimension of this prayer. Our Lady says many times in these messages, this prayer prepares the world for the dogma. So you see this beautiful balance between truth and love? that Our Lady wants the truth about her role as co-redemptrix, mediatrix, and advocate, uh, defined so that she can do that more. She can be that more for us. A good mother does three things for her children. Number one, she suffers, sometimes soon after conception, certainly at birth, and then for the rest of their lives. Uh, you know, I've got uh, eight children. My oldest is 32 with four grandkids. Of course, my relationship to him is different now, but when he suffers, I suffer. That comes with parental love. A mother suffers. Number two, a mother nourishes. Uh, the idea of a surrogate mother is no one's complete understanding of motherhood, right? Well, I just gave birth to the kid. What else do you expect? Uh, no, there's nurturing and formation and love. Thirdly, a mother pleads. She intercedes. That's what Our Lady does for us. This is not rocket science. Co-redemptrix, mediatrix, and advocate is Mary suffering, Mary nourishing, Mary pleading? Of course she does these things. Now, this prayer, again, she says, holds a power before the throne of God unknown. And she asks us to pray it every day. First message, I want to read you just two more. April 29th, 1951. And, and again, keep this historically in mind. These other dogmas are defined. The church is calling for this. Theologians are calling for it. Our Lady comes and says, I want it too. It doesn't originate. It's confirmed in this. This is a April 29, 1951 message. She says, and I quote, I stand here as the co-redemptrix and advocate. Everything should be concentrated on that. Repeat this after me. The new dogma 
will be the dogma of the co-redemptrix. Notice I lay special emphasis on co. I have said that it will arouse much controversy. Once again, I tell you that the church, Rome, will carry it through and silence all objections. The church, Rome, will incur opposition and overcome it. The church, Rome, will become stronger and mightier in proportion to the resistance she puts up in the struggle. Isn't that an interesting note? The more Rome, the more the Vatican, the more the Holy Father defends, articulates, promulgates, preaches the mother, two things will happen. More difficulty, more victory. And that's the way it always is. Jesus is the sign of contradiction. His mother is the mother of the sign of contradiction. You speak the truth about Mary, expect a little hassle, and expect tremendous grace. It's the way it always happens. Our Lady goes on. In the sufferings, both spiritual and bodily, the Lady, the mother, has shared. She has always gone before. As soon as the Father has elected her, she was the co-redemptrix with the Redeemer, who came into the world as the, as the man-god. Tell that to your theologians. Then she says, I know well the struggle will be hard and bitter. And then the lady smiles to herself and seems to gaze into the far distance, but the outcome is already assured. This is the mother of God saying, not if, but when this dogma will be. Uh, and some of that when depends on you and me. As one author said, it's almost like the Blessed Mother is 10 months pregnant with this dogma. She wants to give birth. Ladies seem to relate to that in a particular way. <laughs> the best I've had is kidney stones. You know, they, they say, I've had 22 kidney stones, and they say kidney stones are supposed to be comparable. So I thought the logical thing for me to do was to name my kidney stones. <laughs> and so I did it on the Petrine line. You know, uh, Peter, Linus, Clement, Sixtus. I thought that would kind of... Anyway, back to the issue. Third and final message, May 31st, 1954. This is arguably the most important message of these approved church messages of Amsterdam. Our Lady says, quote, Once more I am here. The co-redemptrix, mediatrix, and advocate is now standing before you. I have chosen this day. On this day the Lady will be crowned. Now, just as an explanatory note, May 31st used to be the feast of the mediatrix of all graces. Uh, during the time of these messages, then it was moved. Our Lady goes on. Theologians and apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ, listen carefully. I have given you the explanation of the dogma. Work and ask for this dogma. You should petition the Holy Father for this dogma. Now let's, let's get this petition idea clear. Petitions have always been part and parcel of Catholic precedents. Pius IX received millions of petitions to define the Immaculate Conception. He did so, and he thanked the people in the definition. Pius XII received nine million petitions over 100 years for the dogma of the Assumption. He defined it, and he thanked the people for the petitions. Petitions are not a West Coast power play uh, where you're trying to you know, pressure the Holy Father. Petitions are children telling the Father what they hope will happen, but it's up to the Father. That's authentic Catholic petitions. And it simply has always been part of the church. We kind of have a bad connotation with petitions because oftentimes we hear about petitions of people trying to change the church's teaching on premarital sex or, or contraception or, or married priesthood or uh, uh, abortion, etc. Petitions to be an authentic Catholic petition has to be something at the heart of the church. But to, petitions have always been part and parcel of this. Our Lady asks us directly to petition the Holy Father. And by the way, if one is disposed to obeying Our Lady, let me throw out quickly. Pope Francis has a very complicated address. So you might want to get this down if you want to do what Our Lady says, okay? Pope Francis, Vatican City. There you go. Uh, and now there's a zip code too, which you don't need. The zip code is 00120, but Americans are so hesitant to write a post a letter without a zip code, they, they feel it's not going to get there. If it, if it affirms you, add a zip code, okay? But you don't need it. Pope Francis, Vatican City. It's hard to think of a more open pope for communication from the world. The only danger, if you write your petition, you may get a cold call from him. <laughs> Let's go on. Then, and I'm going to summarize this for time, then Our Lady gives Ida a vision of the dogma. 
They're in St. Peter's Square. The Holy Father holds up his hands. There's cardinals all around. And Our Lady says, this is what will be. So once again, this is not something theoretical. This will happen. The question is always, how soon? If you're a mother and you've got kids playing on the freeway and you're, you're shocked and you, you realize the danger of that, you'd rather get them off now. Well, guess what? There's a lot of kids playing on the moral freeway right now. Our lady wants to get them off. She can't get them off until we let her. Why? Because God always respects human freedom. One author put it this way. It's beautiful. That God the Father waited for the, for the yes of Mary to bring us Jesus. Now Mary waits for our yes to bring us the graces of the triumph. It's up to us. She goes on. Again, the lady waits a while and then says in a low voice, my prophecy from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed will be fulfilled more than ever once the dogma has been proclaimed. From now on, all nations will call me blessed. The lady of all nations desires unity in the Holy Spirit of truth. The world is encompassed by a false spirit, Satan. When the dogma, the last dogma in Marian history has been proclaimed, the lady of all nations will give peace, true peace to the world. The nations, however, must say my prayer in union with the church. They must know that the lady of all nations has come as co-redemptrix, mediatrix, and advocate. So be it. So notice the clarity of what Our Lady is saying here. She wants to redo what happens at Pentecost. How does that happen? through her mediation, through her motherhood. St. Maximilian Kolbe, master theologian. In fact, good news, I, I just wrote an endorsement for the complete works of St. Maximilian coming out in English, thank God. St. Maximilian says, the Holy Spirit acts only through Mary, not out of necessity, but out of disposition, desire. Well, think about it. The first time the Holy Spirit acted through Mary, what happened? We got Jesus. That's pretty good. Don't fix what ain't broke. That's a good thing. So it makes all the sense in the world that the Holy Spirit is going to mediate all later graces through Mary. And that's the importance of her presence, presence at the cynical. So she wants to do, and God wants to effect a new Pentecost. What's well, going to be through the mother. This is all throughout St. Louis de Marita Montfort, St. Maximilian Kolbe, a great German theologian named uh, uh, Schaben that the Spirit will come to us through the, mother, through the Blessed Mother. That's the new Pentecost. But again, we have to cooperate. And so, in this regard, Our Lady has asked for two critical action steps. And, and doesn't it always come down to that? It's not a matter just of uh, hearing these things. Teresa of Avila put it beautifully. She said to the nuns, don't just meditate. You've got to put that stuff into action. Otherwise, it's like bees around honey, and you're stealing, but you're not giving. So we, we hear, but we've got to respond. And it's funny, if, if Our Lady came down and said, okay, I'll give you peace in the world, but I want you to fast four times a week for three years, people would say, well, that's, that's pretty heavy, but for peace in the world, that, that would be worth it. Then she'll say something like, I want you to say a prayer a day takes about 45 seconds. I want you to write one letter to the Holy Father. It might take you five minutes. And the other small things in the other elements of messages, Our Lady is saying, this is your part as the remnant. We need you to do this. The Father will not allow us to force grace. That's a one uh, rule of heaven. Grace cannot be forced upon the human will. The human will is free, even sadly unto death, and even sadly unto hell, if necessary, so does the Father respect human freedom. And so that's why heaven asks us to cooperate. In this regard, heaven's asking us to cooperate in two forms. Number one, and you've heard them both. Number one is to pray the prayer of the Lady of All Nations every day. Probably wouldn't hurt heaven if you got a couple more times a day since it's between 30 and 45 seconds. It's a beautiful prayer. And you notice how this comes together with the flame of love, with, you know, come Holy Spirit, comes with the Immaculate Heart of Mary. It's the same format. 
If you want a visual, visual, visualize the Holy Spirit as a dove contained in the Immaculate Heart. Why is he in there? Because he wants to come through her Immaculate Heart. When the triumph of the Immaculate Heart takes place, when this dogma is pronounced, that's the freedom for the Holy Spirit to come upon us through that Immaculate Heart. But right now, the Spirit's on deck, if you will. Right now, the Spirit is still in the Immaculate Heart, waiting to burst upon humanity. John Paul II prayed for a new springtime, for a new Pentecost. Pope Benedict prayed for a new springtime, new Pentecost. The popes are doing this. We have to respond. So number one, pray the prayer of the Lady of All Nations every day. Number two, petition the Holy Father. Again, not only is it Catholic precedent, but especially with this Holy Father, there's such an openness to him. You don't have to write the, you know, the confessions of St. Augustine to him. Uh, a, a couple lines would be fine. Ask the Holy Spirit through the Immaculate Heart to say what you'd want to say to the Holy Father. It could be anything from Holy Father, I support you in making this proclamation. Or Holy Father, please pray that this, you know, if this be your will. Uh, I had the, the grace of having a, a brief but a fruitful uh, meeting with him on May 27th after the Wednesday audience. I believe he's the Pope to do this, and I'll tell you why. Number one, he's absolutely Marian, both in doctrine and pastorally. Number two, in a certain sense, he doesn't need a lot of support to do what he believes God wants him to do. And you need both those things to proclaim a Marian dogma. Even if it only has a minority support among various other groups of, of the hierarchy. So he's a prophetic man. He's a man of prayer, and he lives spiritual motherhood. He doesn't go anywhere without stopping at uh, the uh, church Santa Maria Maggiore. Uh, now the press isn't even uh, reporting it anymore because it's so commonplace. Any place, anytime he goes anywhere, he stops there first. He prays in front of the uh, uh, Populus uh, Romani, the image of Our Lady, uh, kind of the, the, the mother of the Roman people. It's, it's most ancient, uh, one of the most ancient images. In fact, they think that St. Luke... Uh, did the image. The only problem is if St. Luke did every image that we attribute to him, he wouldn't have any time to write a gospel. But anyway, it's, 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 it's ancient. And then when he comes back from a trip, he does the same thing. His Marian love, even at the audience, uh, before I was able to speak with him briefly, uh, he was talking about engagement. And in the middle of the audience, he said, let's stop. Let's stop and just pray a Hail Mary to the Madonna for everyone that's engaged throughout the world. He's spontaneously Marian, he's organically Marian, and he's got courage to do whatever he believes that Jesus wants them to do. So I ask you to pray for him for this proclamation, but I also ask you to write five to seven minutes. And let's get practical for a moment. Put it on an envelope, three postage stamps from the US. That's all it takes, three postage stamps. From your heart to his. And I can guarantee you this makes a difference. I had some good meetings in Rome uh, before leaving after the brief uh, uh, encounter with the Holy Father. And, and let me give you a, a reason why. Take a scenario A. Scenario A is the Pope makes a Marian proclamation, which he knows heaven wants, but he does it on his own. Okay? That's scenario A. Scenario B is the Pope makes a proclamation he knows heaven wants with the support of millions of Catholics. Which is easier for the Holy Father? So don't think of it as a pressure. Think of it as a help, as an aid to fulfill this, because... My friends, heaven is not going to change its condition for world peace. The mother has to be proclaimed. And again, I say this, this unity and, and the benefit of this conference, bringing the different movements together, we've got to do this. Uh, I would expect, because there's more moral degeneration, like what happened yesterday, expect more of the next two. Expect more natural disaster. Expect more war. The Father prefers mercy, but if we don't respond, it will be justice. Hold true to our dedication as a Marian remnant to do whatever heaven wants in peace and in joy. And now, why, why is joy so important? Well, imagine 10 people lined up in a line. Nine of them look like walking death. Just discourage everything else. You're smiling. There's a sparkle in your eye. There's a peace. Someone drops something. You run up and help them up. Why does that matter? Because joy 
becomes the opening of authentic evangelization. They'll say, I don't know what you have, but I know I need it. And you may not start by reading the catechism to them. It might be your joy which opens them up to Christ through Mary. So we have to be people of joy, regardless of what happens in the world. And that only comes through Eucharistic adoration, through rosary, through the chapel of divine mercy, through the other devotions we know we're supposed to do, along with the elements Our Lady says over and over, and these specific graces. So in closing, I encourage you, keep faith and keep joy. Let's give our fiat to the things Our Lady has asked to do. If you have not written a letter to the Holy Father, please do it. If you've already written a letter, guess what? Is it ever legitimate for a child to ask twice of a parent? That's okay. Especially when it has to do with world peace, I think that's doubly okay. okay. So write and peace, and let's keep our confidence. Whenever we focus on the adversary, we have the danger of entering, entering more into what he does. We focus on the victors. Jesus is the qualitative and the quantitative victor, and so is the mother. We put our hearts between the heart of Jesus and Mary. We have peace, we have courage, we have joy, and we have obedience to exactly what Our Lady is asking us to do today. Thanks. God bless.